Thank you uh, for joining today's Ignite webcast, and welcome. Uh, so let me first explain what uh, the Ignite webcasts are. Ignite events are a series of technical workshops for IT professionals and Microsoft partners. And uh, this Ignite webcast series will address different technical subjects and scenarios that are beneficial to anyone who wants to increase their knowledge of the Office 365 suite. So my name is Josh Topel, and I'm a program manager for Office 365. And today we are really happy to welcome back Brian Day as our presenter. Brian is a senior program manager from the Microsoft Exchange customer adoption team. And in today's webcast, Brian will be diving into Exchange eDiscovery. So today's session provides a great opportunity to hear directly from a Microsoft employee and learn about some of the new features and releases for Office 365. Today's webcast will be about an hour, and we'll leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the call to field questions from anyone. So please hold all your questions till the end. Uh, and then during our Q&A portion, you can go ahead and type them into the link chat box. One last thing is that we are recording today's session, and we'll have the slideshow and the video available online on the original Ignite blog post on the Office 365 community, which you can find right there in the chat window. Uh, so that's it for me. So Brian, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks, Josh, and thank you, everybody, for coming back to the latest Ignite session. Um, as mentioned, so my name is Brian Day, uh, Senior Program Manager on the Exchange Customer Adoption Team with an Exchange Program uh, Product Group. And today we're going to cover a few different areas and give you, a, hopefully, a good overview on some of the investments that we've made in the new Exchange and the new Exchange Online when it comes to um, archiving e-discovery uh, compliance and a new feature called data loss prevention. So we've got... Uh, a number of different topics here, and hopefully you'll find that we have a, a nice sampling of data from each one. And as Josh said, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, I can't see your questions as they're being typed, so please don't feel like I'm ignoring you. If you're, you know, you've got a question that you really want answered right now, all I see is the PowerPoint, so we'll get to those at the end. And if there are any questions that I can't answer because I just don't know the answer, um, I'm sure we're going to have a, a follow-up area perhaps at the end. Um, when Josh comes back, he'll describe how you guys can get back in touch with us and I can go off and get those answers for you and make sure that you get them answered. So without further ado, and feel free, um, Josh or anybody, if, if you do have audio capability, to let us know if suddenly the, the presentation drops out or if there's any other problems with the audio. So as we were designing um, Exchange Server 2013 and the, the new Exchange Online as part of Office 365 suite, there were a number of core pillars that we wanted to, to think about when it came into these areas. Uh, from left to right, really the user and the administrative experience, we wanted to make it as simple as possible for people that either were already using Exchange 2010's features in, in this area um, or have never used any feature at all from the Microsoft stack. We wanted to make it uh, really easy for them to be able to quickly understand how to use the feature, what the feature does, and what they can do and going forward from an admin side uh, to be able to collect data, report on it, and do different things that we're going to show you in a little few minutes. Uh, data governance is becoming a huge thing in a, across a whole lot of different uh, markets worldwide. Uh, whether you're a, in a financial industry or healthcare industry or government, uh, we're finding that customers, small and large, are really needing to tackle different areas when it comes to data governance and being able to understand not only what they need to collect, but once they've got it collected, what they do with it. All right. Uh, moving on to immutability, being able to prove that the data that you've collected is the data that was, you know, is there and was not been tampered with. And last but not least, e-discovery itself. How do you take all that data that you have within your systems and really narrow down to the areas that you have to collect and not include a bunch of other stuff you may not want to include in the results that you may have to pass off to legal counsel? So real quick touch point on a few of the different options or features that come across these different pillars that we were talking about. Um, if, if any of you are familiar with the Exchange Server 2010 stack, uh, when it comes to archiving and e-discovery, some of this may be a bit of a repeat for you, but for those that it is brand new, let's kind of, we're going to set the bar a little bit so everybody's on the same playing field. So we still, in Exchange Server 2013 and Exchange Online, have the idea of the in-place archive with the secondary quota, and we're going to show you what that looks like in a few moments. Um, we do support a, a very large number of options when it comes to where that archive is housed. We'll talk about those. And we're going to get into not only Exchange, but also when it comes to linking SharePoint. There's been a lot of work done across the office organization on tying those uh, three major areas together so that an administrator can do a, a single search from one location 
and start to figure out, you know, what does the entire view of this issue we're trying to investigate look like across Link, Exchange, and SharePoint? Uh, we'll talk about what happens when messages are deleted, you know, or even if they're changed. How can we prove if a message has been changed or not? Um, how do we hold on to messages once we've figured out we need to, these are the ones that we need to keep, at least for a period of time? Uh, we'll talk about the policies themselves. So when we are setting our data governance policies, uh, how long is it before we delete messages? How long is it before we move messages from one mailbox to another? And finally, we'll have a couple little examples on the e-discovery portal itself, uh, which, again, covers Exchange, Link, SharePoint, and even file shares, and talk about how those can be used and some of the investments made to make that experience a lot easier than it actually was even in Exchange Server 2010. So when we talk about the user experience, we wanted to make sure that a user that was either already familiar with using Outlook or OWA, or maybe they're coming from a different client, but have a pretty easy time understanding where the data was living. So we mentioned briefly that there's still the concept of an archive mailbox or personal archive on Exchange Server 2013 and just like Exchange Server 2010. Now, if you were to look at the UIs between Outlook, and this would be Outlook 20, uh, 2007 professional or higher, so I mean Office 2007 professional or higher, 2010 professional, and 2013 professional. Um, and 2007 does have a, a limited feature set, but it can see the archive structure. Um, you would see this pretty similar to what you will find in OWA. Um, on the left-hand side, we see Outlook, what the folder structure would look like. On the right-hand side, we see OWA. Now, you'll notice that on the left-hand side, uh, Sarah's full email address shows up there, but on the right-hand side, an OO always sees her display name of Sarah Davis. A little further down, we see the archive with her email address and the archive with her display name. Now, there's a very specific reason that when you're working in the client, we decided to show the email address on Outlook, but not within OWA. Because starting in Outlook 2010, you had the capability of adding more than one Exchange account to one single profile in Outlook. And we wanted to make sure that if you just so happen to have two Sarah Davises in the company, which is completely possible in a large organization, you would know exactly which mailbox you were working with. So we displayed the, uh, the email addresses for those mailboxes. Whereas on the right-hand side, OWA can only show one mailbox per browser window at a time. So you always know which mailbox you're working with. But another idea here was that when you have an archive, we wanted it to feel familiar to clients of years past. So this looks like, an, like a PST file has been attached. We went out, did some investigations, found that you know, a, long, a lot of the times customers are very, very familiar with having many PST files attached to Outlook. They're familiar with dragging and dropping between the mailboxes and the PSTs. So we can decided to continue that experience going forward so that your users would have a very easy transition from going with the PST files to an online archive. Um, we will retain the folder hierarchy. So if you had a, a message as shown here that was in your primary mailbox where it was inbox and then a subfolder of September, if we were to move those messages from your primary mailbox to your archive mailbox based on the policy that you have set on the server, we will retain your folder hierarchy. So if the folder does not already exist, we will create it in your archive mailbox so that your users will know exactly what folder to go to if they're going to manually browse through the folder path to find items that they're looking for. On top of this, so beyond just the fact that we say the folder structure itself, so here in OWA, we're showing you that you can actually just search the entire mailbox in the archive from one place if you want to. So if you don't want to have to browse through your archive structure because maybe there's endless number of folders and subfolders, you can just search from one place. So as you start searching in the search bar, you'll notice that on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, some options pop up. So you can see you can search your entire mailbox, your entire mailbox plus your archive mailbox, or just the folder that you're currently in, and we list the folder name that you're currently in right there. We also give you some options down below on how far back we want to look. And then on the right-hand side, you'll notice that there's some highlighting going on. And the highlighting is happening due to some core investments that Office has made to integrate uh, what used to be known as the fast search technology into the new Office. So now you'll hear a lot of us in Exchange or SharePoint or Link talking about what we call search foundations. And search foundations was an investment we did to integrate fast into the Office product suite. And that now gives us the ability to not just return the email that you were looking for, but also point out exactly the area within the email that hits the keywords you were looking for. So if you had an email that was 30 pages long in the past, 
you know, you might have typed project update and all you got back was the email, and then you had to search, 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 search to find where project update is. Now we'll just highlight it for you so it's immediately uh, noticeable if you were to scroll quickly through that message. All right. Forgot about the animation. Sorry about that. Now, if you're familiar with uh, Exchange Server 2010, this may look slightly familiar to you. You'll notice that we've now in OWA, uh, we are selecting uh, the right, right click and then properties of a, of a item here, and we can see we have an assigned policy. And when we talk about archives, and we're going to get a little deeper into this in a moment, we have what we call archive policies and retention policies. Now, an archive policy means that if we were to look at the very top one here, move to archive after six months, simply means that if a message were to come into say our inbox and I did nothing with it, if the inbox was set to move after six months, we would literally move that mail from the inbox to the inbox folder within the archive. Relatively straightforward. A retention policy, and you can have one of each on both on a single item, so I could have both an archive policy and a retention policy on an email. So my archive policy might be six months, and my retention policy might be five years. So you can see we have a delete after five years option down under retention policy. So what this would mean is that if I were to apply both to a single email, let's say, and this can be done at the folder level as well, and we also have what we call the fall policy tags, which we'll talk about in a moment, that apply to the entire mailbox. But for one email, let's say we had both. Six months after that email is received, it would be moved to our personal archive. Okay, so six months later, the, the archive policy tag has kicked in. Now, because we've also set a retention policy of five years, what this means is that once the message is older than five years, we will delete it. It does not mean that we will force the item to stick around for five years. There are other ways to, to accomplish that type of goal. But once the item is over five years old, we will then delete it from the archive mailbox. Now, this is a total age. So because we moved it after six months, it is only going to live within their archive for an additional four and a half years, for a total of five years. It's an important point to keep in mind. Um, we have seen some confusion in the past where they might have thought it would be five and a half years because the move to archive was six months and then the delete was five years. It is now a single menu. Uh, in past, you may have seen that we had a couple different menus where one was for assign an archive policy and one was assign a retention policy. That has been cleaned up quite a bit. And if we were to switch over to Outlook for a moment, you would see that the, the interface is relatively similar. So we're looking at the, the properties of the deleted items folder right now. The deleted items folder currently is set to delete items after 30 days. Right? And it's a policy that is enforced. It's the only one that's allowed by, uh, for the user to select. So there is no other drop down there for them to change things to because this company wants deleted items emptied after 30 days. However, down below, we see online archive is set to six months. So it's kind of an interesting example here because guess what? Well, they're deleting after 30 days. So in this example, there actually won't be anything that can move after six months because everything will be gone before then. But let's just say the folder policy up above was, um, oh, I don't know, one year. So if it was one year, yet the archive was six months, well, the six-month archive would kick in first, and then six months later the item would be deleted. But since you can see the drop-down menu is selectable down below, it would give that user the ability to select different online archive policies if your company wants that capability. Behind the delete items properties window, you can see that we have the message itself. Uh, the retention policy is displayed right under the, the two line here, so you can see that the particular message they have open in the background is delete after 10 years. So that message will be allowed to be retained for 10 years. When it is older than 10 years, that message will be purged from the system the next time the, the what we call the managed folder assistant goes through and processes this mailbox. Now, on data governance itself, you've heard me talking about retention tags and deleting and archiving. What exactly does that mean? So if we were to take for a moment, there's a type column here. You'll see a few different things listed. You see personal, you see all, and you see deleted items. Personal is literally what we call a personal tag. Deleted items is a tag that is applied to a specific folder within the mailbox. So you could do this to something like 
inbox, deleted items, sent items, etc. And all is what we call a default personal tag. You'll see this commonly called a, a DPT. So if we talk about the default policy tag for a moment, so we see down below there's a corp exec default for 1,095 days, which would be three years. If this was applied to a mailbox, what would happen is every single item in that mailbox would be deleted after three years. That would be the default. Now, let's say that that same person also had the corp exec deleted items policy um, tag assigned to their deleted items folder. This would mean that every item within the mailbox would be deleted after three years unless it is in the deleted items folder. If it is in the deleted items folder, it's deleted after 30 days. So it's a nice, easy way to keep your deleted items folder clean of old mail that people probably don't want anyways. The personal tags, these are the ones that the users can override with if you want to allow them to do this. So if for some reason somebody had a folder within their mailbox and they said, yeah, you know what, um, it's a distribution group, I really don't need to keep this data very long, I want to keep my quota under control, they might go and apply that one week delete to the distribution group folder if they move all their mails to that distribution group to a particular folder. So this way all their company mail that's important is deleted after three years, but that distribution group is deleted after one week. We won't need to keep that those items. Again, completely configurable, whether or not you want to allow personal tags to happen in your environment, but we give you the flexibility if, if that helps you meet your business needs. Um, again, on the far right-hand side, you can see we've got the delete option and the archive um, option. Again, those are the only two types that exist right now, either whether or not to delete, or you can think of it as a move policy to move an item from their primary mailbox to their archive mailbox. So with all this data in mind, what's the beginning to end? The problem is everybody's getting more mail. Message sizes are going up. Message rates are going up. It's just becoming somewhat out of control when you stop and think about it. So we really need to help you guys identify the mail that you want to keep. How do you preserve it and keep it on the system? How do we whittle down exactly what we need out of that large batch of mail review it and then produce it, whether to an internal department, perhaps opposing legal counsel. And really kind of the, as we move from volume to relevance is the way to think about this. So let's start looking at what our, our search capabilities are. So the new eDiscovery portal, whether you're using Exchange Server 2013 on premises or Exchange Online, is built on top of SharePoint. So what this does mean is that if you're using the on-premises versions of the servers, you will have to build a very small SharePoint site to enable the extra functionality. If you don't have any SharePoint systems available on-premises and you really don't want to stand one up, as far as Exchange goes, you'll still be able to get the very similar functionality that existed in Exchange Server 2010. If you do want to get all of the stuff that you're about to see, you will have to stand up a small SharePoint site that Exchange can hook into. So we have discovery set, something that is new. This is where you can almost think about as case management. So we can see we've got one there, Fabricom Preview, another one, HR Audit. These are sets that you can set up and then come back to and look at different times. And then we've got searches and exports, something you can do immediately. Go do a query, export everything out to maybe a PST or an XML file to hand off to a third party company. So what can we actually search? What a large amount of things now. So when you have this centralized e-discovery portal, um, at the top we can see that we've added a couple mailboxes. We've got Jamie and Renee's mailboxes. We can continue to add more if we'd like to. Down below we've got a, a SharePoint site. The name has been resolved to the finance team. And we've actually got a file share. So you can, all, you can share, uh, excuse me, search your file shares as well. What is also going to be contained within the mailboxes, if you have enabled it, is any of your link archiving. And we're going to touch on to how that works a few slides from now. So think about this as a mailbox could be the mailbox content and link archiving content, if you put it in there, as well as SharePoint sites and file shares. All right, so we've selected our users and sites to preserve. We've got a couple of mailboxes. What would we do after that? So here's an example of a discovery site called HR Executives. We've got three mailboxes, we've got three SharePoint sites, and over on the right-hand side, we can see that we've already got some item counts and sizes. So we've actually already gone and done this query to see what we're gonna find. Kind of down in the middle, you'll see a filter 
area. Right now it says TRAD star. So what we've actually searched for is anything that starts with those letters. It may be traders, might be trade, um, could be trademark, anything that starts with that, and then we use the asterisk wildcard afterwards. Uh, we've not set a start and end date, so we are searching the entire contents of these sites and mailboxes. We do not, we are not looking for just this particular range right now. We did not narrow in on a particular author sender, so we're just looking at everything. We didn't care who it came from. And down below, we can see that we've got the in place hold turned on, and that's reflected up above in the hold status that says enable. Now, in place hold is something new to Exchange Server 2013 and the new Exchange Online. And what the in place hold will do is it'll leave that message within the person's mailbox. It will even allow that person to delete the message to, as far as they're concerned. But behind the scenes, that message will remain in place until this discovery set has been closed. So even though the user thinks that they have deleted it, it will still be there for you to search and export if necessary. And we'll show you how that works coming up a little bit later. Right, so a query of what to preserve. We've turned on the hold. You could optionally not turn on the hold. You might not turn on the hold if your results came back and it looked like you suddenly had a petabyte, wor petabyte worth of data to save. Maybe your query was a little too vague and you had to narrow it down. So what, what can we do? So let's say your query did come back and it was a bit vague and that search there wasn't quite what we were looking for. It hit way too many items. You could tell it wasn't going to work properly. Well, remember when I said earlier that we've done some investments by integrating the fast search technology into Office? We now call it the Search Foundations. Here's where we start to see some of those benefits. So there's another discovery set here. It's called an Investor Relations Query. And you can see the query has now gotten a little more complex. Now we have Investor Near 30 Relations or Finance Star. So the way to read this is we're looking for the words investor and relations within 30 words of each other or something that starts with finance. So if I had a very long email and the word investor is at the top and four or five paragraphs down, the word relations exists, that's probably not going to be hit unless there are very short paragraphs and there's less than 30 words between the, the two query words here. However, if I had a sentence that said something along the lines of, uh, we have to consider our investor relations before we execute this project. Well, since those words are right next to each other, that email will be returned inside of your search. So again, uh, they've already executed this search. We can see that in the file, they've already come back with almost 270 items. Uh, we can see within Contoso, which is either a, a SharePoint site or a mailbox name, hard to tell by that example. We've got 109 items at 20 megs and a couple of more mailboxes. We can see there's about 260 megs worth of data returned. Again, if all of a sudden you saw this brought back 40 gigs worth of data, perhaps the terms aren't quite good enough. We need to spread the near verb out a little bit more. Maybe you had it too small. Maybe it was within five words of each other, and you need to expand it out. You can also see down below we've got an exchange in the SharePoint tab, so you can start to see exactly what we found out there. Perhaps you only want to whittle it down to emails and meetings for exchange. You don't want contacts and tasks to be included in your search results. You can do that there as well. If you want, you could click on the item there and open it up, see what it looks like. If we were to expand the view a little bit more, you can see who the recipients are, you can see who the sender was, and you can also see the date. Now, the query up there is something that we call the KQL language, or keyword query language, and that's part of what FAST gives us, now named Search Foundations. So that's where we get the nice new proximity search. And any of the, the, the syntaxes that you are familiar with in the past, the advanced query options or advanced query syntax, you can continue to use those as well. Search Foundations is just going to give us a few more options. Now, we give you the query statistics over here on the right. And you could expand this if you wanted and see, okay, which part of my query was bringing back the most results? Was it the investor near relations? Was it the word finance for the wild card? Which one of these, perhaps, if I came back and found I was going to get 30,000 emails, do I need to whittle down to be a little more clear? And if you need to, just click on one of those emails. Um, you can see conversation with Renee here has been opened up, and we can see what they were talking about. So moving beyond, everybody's favorite topic, regulatory requirements. This has changed drastically just over the past few years. 
Uh, this is where, you know, Office 365 um, can help adhere to a number of regulatory requirements. We publish what those out are out. We'll even give you guys certificates for certain ones. And how can a lot of these features help you meet the regulatory requirements for on-premises as well? Well, now that you've seen where can we search, how can we search, what happens when we get all that information back? One of the things that we can do, we talked about, which is the in-place hold settings. Now, for Office 365 with Exchange Online, something additional that you get is something called an in-place hold that is uh, time-based. So in this case, we're showing you, okay, I've got my in-place hold set for this discovery, um, but instead of holding it indefinitely, I really only need to keep it for 10 years here. And, that, and you know, I'm sure a lot of you on the call have seen these uh, court cases that just go on forever and ever and ever. You know, but we're going to give you the ability to either do an indefinite hold, or if it meets your needs, you can specify you know, just 10 years. And then after 10 years, those items will be automatically purged from the system. And I'll the animation finish here. All right. So in place hold, there's a number of variants. So litigation hold, which is the, the old way of thinking Exchange Server 2010, is when we just put a mailbox on litigation hold, and absolutely everything in that mailbox is preserved as it was. Um, again, users can try to delete it. It doesn't really get deleted in the background. We'll show you how that works. Uh, in place hold indefinite, or the time-based in place hold, uh, same feature, just whether or not we're going to keep the items indefinitely or not. And then also the, the query query based in place hold, which is where we're showing you in the discovery portal, where we really whittle down to very specific queries uh, based items and put the in place hold only in those items. Uh, the management options, really all we're saying here is you can get to all these things from anywhere. So there's the new eDiscovery portal, right? So that we showed you that is based off of the SharePoint site. You can get to that through the Change Admin Center. Or if you're familiar with PowerShell and you want to write everything through scripts, by all means, go ahead and do that. Um, as anybody is aware, you know, starting Exchange 2007, all the UI interfaces were really just PowerShell wrappers. So everything that we're doing in the eDiscovery portal or through Exchange Admin Center or even, you know, just through uh, the older version, ECP in 2010, we were just executing PowerShell commands in the background. So if you wanted to automate some of these processes, you could certainly do that through the management shell itself. So the life cycle of a mailbox. Let's talk about that. You've already heard me mention, well, we kind of let things get deleted, but not really. So if we were to look years ago, a, life, a mailbox life cycle would have had, you know, an inbox, a bunch of other folders, deleted items, and then there was the idea of a dumpster. And the dumpster was just a, a area that we kept items that had a deleted flag on them for a certain period of time. It really wasn't much more than that. Starting in 2010, we called the dumpster dumpster 2.0 because it sounded great. And when you look at it through the PowerShell command, that you'll see it is now called recoverable items. The benefits that this has given us is the recoverable items folder itself is now an actual folder within the mailbox. It's indexed, so it's searchable from an admin perspective, and we can do a lot of other fancy things that we're about to go through. So now, in Exchange Server 2010 and now Exchange Server 2013, a message may come into the mailbox, it lands into the inbox. It stays there for some period of time. You know, maybe it's, it stays there until it is moved by a, an archive tag that we saw earlier, or maybe the user deletes it on their own. You know, sometime later, let's say the user deletes the item, they move it to deleted items. Okay? They go a step forward, they empty their deleted items. Once they've emptied their deleted items, it moves into the recoverable items area, more specifically, the deletion subfolder of recoverable items. What I'll mention right now is the deletions folder is the only one a user has access to. So if I was to go and do recover deleted items, this is the folder they can see. They cannot see any of the folders beneath that, versions, purges, audits, etc. Now let's say I'm a sneaky user. I see an email that comes out to my department. And it says, you know, keep all mail relevant to customer X because it looks like we may have a court case coming up. Well, uh, I see that come in. I know I might not have done something appropriate, and I try to purge that message. Well, 
what happens is before that email came out, my IT department or my legal department, if we delegated the rights to them, had the, the frame of mind to say that we should probably lock these people down before we send out the email. So now I have gone and tried to purge the message, and the message has just been moved from deletions to purges. And that is instant evidence that I have taken a manual step to try to delete this content permanently. And that item is now going to be held within a purges folder of recoverable items. Now, if I'm on litigation hold, that item is just going to stay there forever until litigation hold is turned off. Now, if that item is found as part of a discovery set, we'll move that item down to the discovery hold. All right, so I've tried to purge that message, but the message was tagged as part of one of our discovery sets. The exchange saw that that message was tagged as part of our discovery set, moves it down to the discovery hold. All right, so now we know it is a message that has tried to have been purged, but it was a message that was a part of a discovery set. So this gives the, uh, the administrators a lot more flexibility to be able to retain these messages, even though the user thinks it's gone. The user thinks it's gone, and the user is no longer affected by the quota um, that this, uh, for the size of the message. So the user may have actually been doing something that, you know, they're, they were getting messages that they're, they were nearing their quota, and they felt like, oh, shoot, i got to get rid of a bunch of messages. I'm going to start deleting and emptying my deleted items and purging stuff out to try to get down below my quota. Might be a legitimate excuse. But because they've gone and purged that data out, even though we're keeping it in the background, we won't hold them accountable for the quota. It wouldn't be fair. They might not even know that they're on um, discovery hold or litigation hold because you might not want to tell them, depending on what the situation is. Now, how about immutability? Well, what if somebody gets a message and they open it up and they edit it and they try to change a contract price? Well, see that versions folder? We will take a copy of that message. We do the, the cow method, copy and write. So if somebody tries to edit a message, we will simply move it, the original version, to the versions folder. So then later on, your discovery search will be able to do uh, a search, find that message, and they'll find that the message sits within the recoverable items versions folder. Instantly, you'll know that that item has been modified for one reason or another, and you'll be able to see the trail of versions if the item was modified multiple times. All right. Okay, single item recovery, sir, and in place hold. Um, again, if you've got items that expire, so if you deleted item retention time, let's say it's 30 days, if the item is tagged for a, dis for a discovery set, we'll just move the item from deletions or purges or, or versions down to the discovery hold area. Every so often, the MFA, as I called it earlier, the managed folder assistant, will come around, process the mailbox. Any item that is eligible for being purged will be removed from the mailbox. If the item is not eligible, perhaps it's part of a discovery set still, uh, we will not delete it from the mailbox. So moving forward, uh, real quickly in years past, when it came to Link 2010 and Exchange 2010, they both had their own kind of archiving capabilities. Problem was that in order to get that compliance to work, you had to set up a, a SQL database just for Link, Exchange did its own archive and its own database. wasn't the easiest of things to get through. Well, that's gotten a lot better. So now, in Exchange 2013 and Link 2013 and Exchange uh, Online and Link Online, the new wave, we actually will archive the information from Link directly into the Exchange mailbox. So you'll have one place to search for Link archive content and Exchange archive content. And you can see there, uh, we'll include instant messaging, any meeting content. So if you're holding a meeting just like we are now, uh, that content will be saved inside the Exchange mailbox itself. Uh, there's one or two different ways you can do this. You could enable link archiving to only be taking place when a user is under a, a discovery hold, or you can turn it on so it's all the time. So if you always want link, ar link content to be archived, you can do that. If you only want it to be archived under certain circumstances, you can do that as well. So what's that look like? So we've got user A is on hold for one particular reason. Don't know why, but they are. Right, that information will then be processed through Link. Link will then push that information through Exchange um, EWS, Exchange Web Services, to the purges folder of recallable items. There is not a Link-specific folder. We'll just use the purges folder for any Link content. And then hold sync is state, hold state is synced from Exchange back to Link. 
So if Link then suddenly saw that their hold state has changed, this user is no longer on hold, Link will stop pushing that content over to Exchange. Now, if you wanted to, you could set it up that Link is always going to push that data to Exchange. That's another option. Um, the, the, whether or not the user is on hold is the primary option. Now, you can see on the left-hand side, so which modalities will we capture? Well, anything. Anything on Link that happens to the PC, mobile, web, or through RWA, um, because the in-place hole is, is on there, because the link archiving is configured for that user at that point, everything is going to be pushed back to Exchange. So large mailboxes, you've seen us have a, a, a big push to have large mailboxes you know, over the last couple of revisions of Exchange. And these days, we really only consider large mailboxes to be mailboxes that are 100 gigabytes or larger. And that'll give you an idea of what we consider large with an exchange online. Really, as we mentioned earlier, try to get rid of PSD files, right? You know, put, them, put everything in one place. Inside one large mailbox makes everybody's lives easier. You can search in one place. You don't have to worry about PSD files being corrupted. There's no question about whether we missed some content when we were searching for it because we know it's all in one place. This makes everything easier for the admins. And users aren't worried about dragging atoms between uh, their mailbox and PSD files because they're trying to fight a low core value. So archives, uh, just like in Exchange 2010, it's a, a single click, basically, to enable an archive in Exchange Server 2013. Uh, they still have a, a quota value and an issue warning value on the archives. You can see their defaults are 50 and 45 megabytes. Um, if you do want to modify those, right there under archiving, you can edit the details of the archive itself. And what we are supporting when it comes to archive location, well, you could have just the cloud, right? So EOA, Exchange Online Archiving. If you want all of your archive content to be stored in a Microsoft data center so you don't have to worry about the purchasing, support, you know, of all that storage, go right ahead. If you want to put your primaries in your archives up in Microsoft's data centers, you can also do that. And we'll also support uh, the hybrid approach. So you might have some users that are, you know, their primary and archive is in the cloud, or their primary and their archive is on premises. You might have two groups of users, depending on what their job function is. The one thing we do not support is the primary mailbox being in the cloud and the archive mailbox being on premises. That is the one uh, situation that we do not support at this time. It really doesn't make any sense if you stop and think about it. So how do we trust the admins? So our auditing reports in Exchange Server also allow us to do uh, searches on litigation hold itself. Right, so I've got a, a friend in IT. I say, hey, you know, I'm having trouble with my mailbox. It's not let me delete some content, it seems. You know, I'll give you a, a bag of Doritos and a case of Mountain Dew. Can you just help me out here for a minute? And I say, oh, yeah, sure, I think he's a swell guy. I turn off their litigation hold. Um, yep, they're able to delete a bunch of content. And then it's, oh, it seems to work now. You can undo whatever you did, right? Well, he just caught me using some social engineering and was able to purge a bunch of data from the system. We will capture that. So our admin audit logging exchange will now be able to capture the fact that an admin has actually gone and changed something to a litigation hold. They've put a user on litigation hold, they've taken a user off litigation hold, and you'll be able to run those audit reports and find out exactly which admin uh, did that change, whether it was on purpose or not, what mailbox was it made to, and what did they actually do. So that'll give you some, some accountability as well. So you can also prove to anybody that ever asked, nope, no, this person's been on litigation hold for this entire time. Here's the audit report. We can show that to you and prove that no changes are made during those, that period of time. So data loss prevention, or DLP. Let's talk about what that is. So DLP is the idea of, I'm going to skip forward to the next slide here, just for time purposes. It's another layer of protection. So you've got Exchange Online protection um, if you're a cloud customer or if you subscribe to EOP standalone, which is the, the new version of Poppy, which is going to look for things like viruses and malware. DLP takes it another step forward and starts to look for what we consider sensitive content. And it, the idea here is to try to help prevent people from doing accidental things. You don't want yourself to be in the newspaper. So EOP, again, ELP will look for anti-spam, anti-malware, and then once we get down to the bottom for the LP, that's where we're going to start to look at things like credit cards or social security numbers, and we're going to show you what that looks like. And really, it's, just, it's to try to help prevent these kinds of things here. I'll just leave these slides up for a moment. To keep yourself out of the newspaper, nobody wants to be the company that 
accidentally sent to bob.smith at an external address instead of robert.smith, which is actually the internal guy with an attachment that had a whole bunch of social security numbers on it. Right, we're trying to help prevent the accidental leakage scenario. Right, another one here from Gartner, you know, about the fact of all the expanding regulatory and industry mandates is making it a lot harder for us to, you know, keep track of all of our data and make sure that none of it is accidentally released. So before we talk about DLP itself, we have to kind of take a step back and talk about transport rules. And if you're familiar with transport rules that have existed since Exchange 2007, but for anybody that is new to Exchange, we'll give you a little overview here. A transport rule is uh, something that takes place during messages when they're in transit. We take a look at the message. Does it match any of the rules that we have configured? Do we need to take any actions on that message? All right, so we've got the name of the rule at the top. Uh, next thing would be the, <coughs> the predicate itself. If something, right, so if we've got the sender or the recipient, any attachment, right, this might be if the sender address contains or if the sender is, something along those lines. If a message header or maybe the received message header contains a particular IP, various conditions that you can select. Actions, right, what are we going to do? If we hit one of those predicates, what are we going to do to that message? Are we going to forward it to somebody else for an approval, right? So maybe it goes to that manage, the person's manager and they have to allow that message to go through. Are we just blocking it? Are we notifying the sender? What are we doing? Some of you might be noticing there's some new options there, and we're going to talk about those in a moment. Now, we also have exceptions. So if we don't want everybody in the company sending to a particular domain, but maybe we allow the executives of the com company to do that, we would put them in here, right? So name of rule, prevent sending to fabricam.com. If recipient equal fabricam.com, block the message, except if sender is member of executive distribution group, something along those lines. But now down at the bottom there, you'll notice that there's a choose a mode for this rule. Enforce this rule, right? It used to just be on and off. Well, now we've actually added test rule with notifications or test rule with notifications disabled. So now, now you can actually test these rules and see if they're going to do exactly what you think they are before you turn them on and they affect everybody in the organization. So that is not just the only new thing. So new options that we have that we didn't before. We can configure them to run for a specific period of time. Perhaps you've got a company holiday and you want to make sure that anybody that sends mail to your company during this holiday realizes they're not going to get a response. Set it to start on Friday morning, stop on Monday morning. Maybe it's a long weekend for your company. Uh, run the test mode, which we already talked about. Filters, right? Test the message size. So in the years past, we were able to do attachment size, but not message size. So that's something new that we've added. We can look at the extensions uh, for attachments, you know, .mp3, .text, whatever it might be and the sender IP. Based on those new options and filters, what could we do? We'll, we'll get criteria-based routing. So in Exchange Online, you could say, hey, if, if this message is sent from this particular IP, route it this way. Or if this message has particular data in it, we're going to make sure it has TLS enabled um, for that message to get routed anywhere further. Now, we've always have opportunistic TLS turned on, but this will just make sure TLS took place when that message is going to go out. If we couldn't get TLS connection, we won't let the message go further. And we also have the stop processing more rules, very similar to Outlook. So if you have a particular transport rule and you want, if you hit that one, you don't want any other rule to apply, enable the option to stop processing more rules. All right. Now, let me skip by this one here just for time purposes, because this is where the good stuff starts. So here's an example. We have a, a user that has put what appears to be a couple of different credit card numbers, expiration dates, people's names, and type inside of an email. Now, you can see a policy tip showed up at the top of uh, Outlook there, and very similar to a mail tip before, we now have these policy tips. Uh, policy tips currently only work in Outlook 2013, uh, so that is not something you're going to see in Outlook 2007 or Outlook 2010. And this one is saying right away, hey, um, you got a credit card number in here. And we don't let that happen. So you can report that this message doesn't have a credit card number if you want in it. And what's interesting when it comes to credit card numbers, we actually need two things to make sure it's a credit card. We need the number and something like the expiration date or, like it says here, Visa, MasterCard. So if I had Visa and the number or MasterCard and the number, that would trigger the policy tip, and that would also trigger Exchange to do something if it saw this message come through. 
Now, Relic 2013 is able to download the DLP rules and fire these policy pips, but that's not where the actual processing takes place. So if you're worried and say, hey, I only have Outlook 2010, can I not use these? The answer is no, you can use these DLPs because the processing is done server-side during the transport layer. So even though your Outlook 2010 might not be able to show the tip to the user, when that message hits Exchange, it will it will filter it, it will see the credit card numbers, and depending on how your policy is set up, perhaps block the message from going any further. So DLP policy templates are what make all this work. And a DLP policy template is like this one here, payment card policy. And we've got the template of the PCI DSS uh, template in place. So we will look for anything that appears to be PCI related data. And once we have that set up, the entire policy itself, right? So we've got content to monitor, which would be the, uh, the PCI DSS data. User action might be something like block the message or block the message but allow an override something along those lines. So the user is allowed to override that action. The override will be logged. It'll actually, a report will be sent to an administrator and say, hey, this person overrode it. Um, here's what we found in it. You can kind of go through and validate whether or not this override was acceptable or not. And then perhaps you need to tweak your policy and make sure that it's not quite as strict as it was before. Uh, we might be looking for credit card numbers, EU debit card numbers. Uh, as you can see here, there's a large amount. This is just a small sampling a large amount of uh, content types that come out of the box. What's also nice is we allow you to create your own types if you want to, and you can import those XML files, um, or even third parties are starting to write and create some of these things that you'll see for sale now later on. So we talked about transport rules because DLP behind the scenes essentially is a, a new kind of transport rule. Looks very similar, doesn't it? You've got a name of the rule, You've got if, so this one you can see is outside the organization the recipient is, and it contains a credit card number. We're going to reject the message with a 571. We're going to set a high audit level on it and notify the sender and create an incident report. So just like a transport rule, uh, DLP policy rules are built on, on top of those with some extra features. Conditions, the actions. Now, interestingly, one nice thing is we also tie into RMS. So if you have RMS enabled, you can say, hey, if it does have this kind of information, slap this RMS template on it. This one here, they're showing company confidential. You might have do not forward or maybe full-time employees only, something along those lines. And RMS now extends into Exchange Online. All right, so you can actually do some work with Exchange Online now. Our default templates are listed there, company confidential, confidential read only. Um, and do not forward, which actually works across different tenants. So if you wanted to um, have some cross-tenant workflows going on, do not forward would work between maybe two of the tenants, but not outside of those ones. And we've got an incident report. So an incident report, if like an override did happen or one of your rules had an incident report enabled on them, you know, we would show you exactly here's the audit data, and the severity medium. If this one was not overridden. It's just something that we had set up to be captured. Uh, you can see who it was to behind there and the subject and everything. Uh, we go further, we can see the classification itself. So it was a credit card number. We found one credit card number and had a confidence level of 85, um, which 85 was actually our minimum confidence level required here. And you can see more of the rule data. Here's the exact rule that they hit, financial data US. So if you need to go and modify your rule to make it a little more strict, less strict, you know exactly which one to target. And we actually showed a credit card number down below there. Um, now, we don't just say, hey, it looks like a credit card number, so fire. We actually use the LUNS algorithm to make sure it's a valid credit card number. So for like Visa, uh, four, but then all ones after it is a, a test number that will actually trigger these to work. So if you want, if you're trying these and you couldn't figure out one to use, you didn't want to use a real personal credit card number, you could use a one with, uh, sorry, a four with all ones and Visa and make up an expiration date. That will trigger the rule. Uh, five with all ones, I believe, is a MasterCard number that will trigger the rule. Uh, now, all this stuff, one management console to rule them all. So the Exchange Admin Center, EAC for short, whether you're using Exchange Server 2013 on-premises or Exchange Online, same place to manage everything. So you'll have one nice place to manage all of your DLP rules, your transport rules, all of your anti-malware, et cetera. 
Exchange Online customers, because you do not have access to the server logs, we're going to be building a, a report portal for you. So if you want, you can check and see how, how often your DLP rules are being fired, um, graph those over time, see how many overrides there have been, how many false positives there have been as reported by users, etc. Now, all the data that's required to make these charts and reports exists on premises. So all that data is there. We'll just be up to you guys to, to roll your own, take the XML data and the logs, and just decide how you want to report on this data. But again, because we don't give direct log access to Exchange Online customers, we did the work for you to provide that. All right. Uh, real quickly, so again, um, DLP is available in Exchange Server and Exchange Online. There's a lot of templates out of the box that have predefined content types. Again, third-party companies, including yourselves, if you want just to do your own, can write your own DLP content types and rules. Those can be imported via XML. Uh, again, EAC, whether you're on-premises or Exchange Online, right there, DLP admin will be, and then the rich reporting for Exchange Online customers we will be creating for you. All right, so I believe with that, Josh, I think we're ready to open it back up to questions. All right, great. And I will switch over so I can see what's being typed. Yeah, great presentation, Brian. Um, so we did have a lot of conversations going back and forth. Uh, so if there are any questions, though, that did not get answered yet, please feel free to type those in, and we'll give about 10 minutes to to go and try to answer everyone's question. And while people are typing those in, I'm going to share uh, some survey questions for you. And if you could answer them in the background, that would be great. And just to promote an, all of our future webcasts, you could find at this link right here. And uh, that is it for me. Oh, also, if you want to ask Brian any additional questions or myself, feel free to contact me on the community at this link. But uh, here's our first question. Thanks again, Brian. Oh, you're welcome, Josh. Okay, so, um, oh, good, we got some of the, the good internal guys here already answering a bunch of stuff. Thank you to them. Uh, let's see, so we have a question from Vivek. Uh, policy tips arriving in OA. So, yes, you're correct. Right now, they're only visible in Outlook 2013. We know folks have been um, asking about OA, unfortunately. It's the standard response. I, I can't comment on future features. I know nobody likes to hear that answer, but that is what I have to say. Um, but we do know that it's something that, uh, people would like to see, feel free to keep sending that feedback in. We love to hear it. Um, hearing the feedback from you guys help us uh, determine where we need to focus on our feature sets. Uh, okay, Dan, so RMS message. So to my understanding, if you send an RMS message from 365 to a non, uh, third-party non-Office 365, you just can open that message. Uh, my understanding is it's going to be no, uh, just like a, a normal on-premises scenario, because they would not be part of the same RMS realm. Uh, if there's anybody that's on the call from Microsoft and knows otherwise, feel free to jump in. Oh, there we go. It's federated. Thank you, Brock. So question for the folks that are responding. So you got a pretty healthy response on Office 365 architecture. Just to help uh, Josh and the Ignite folks out, if you know, wouldn't mind typing in what you believe architecture means, I would definitely help them you know, create those going forward, those presentations. Uh, if there's a question that hasn't been answered, feel free to copy and paste it just down the bottom. Social media content. Okay. Um, Robert, I know it's not the easiest to type in this format, but where would that social media content be coming from? How is it integrated? And, again, if you want to follow up on that um, community that Josh just went to there, sometimes it's easier for us to go back and forth. Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, I am not personally aware of any hooks into Twitter or LinkedIn at this point. Uh, yeah, exactly like that. So we don't store that data. It's like the social connector in Outlook itself doesn't store any of that stuff that you kind of see down the bottom. So for FINRA, when they say social media content, is that like if I had a Twitter account and I was sending tweets, or is that something else? 
or was it just like tweets that they were browsing somewhere? Okay, yeah, so like Brad and Ethan said, if it would have to be something that we could ingest into the product itself. I'm not aware of any uh, Twitter or um, LinkedIn hooks for that right now. Yammer, excellent question, um, since we did acquire them. I have not seen anything uh, publicly released on what the plans are as far as uh, Yammer integration at this point. Yeah, there you go. Is it possible to search litigation, whole message, and hybrid implementation in cloud and on-prem mailboxes together? Yes, as Brad said, you can do that. So again, one, one search portal to rule them all. You're welcome. Uh, Mopi, Tennessee. Okay, Jennifer Woods, more information. Uh, Jennifer, are you speaking to multi-tenancy as far as Office 365 or if you are a hosting provider yourself? Okay, great. I'll, um, I'll talk with the, the chaps that are working on some of the hosting guidance and see if there's anything specific that we need to provide there. Uh, Dan, yeah, so you, when you are an Office 365 customer, as long as you have uh, the appropriate licensing, then yes, you'll have the discovery portal. Uh, Todd, as far as Office 365, okay, so an Office 365 multi-tenant, um, I believe everything that you saw here today is available in multi-tenant, including those charts and reports, which aren't out of the box for um, on-premises. Okay, good. A lot of good stuff here. Let's see. He's not going Oh, the wise guy in the call. We don't need anybody, Ray. We're not taking anybody first round. We're just going to give up all of our picks this year. Uh, let's see. Outbound transport, on-prem exchange, to EOP, and hybrid mode. I say it's working all the way I believe you got the right answer there, Martina. Uh, we might have to follow up on that one. For the folks that answered maybe on joining the next webcast session, all feedback is welcome. Don't feel like you're going to hurt our feelings. Is there something that you'd like to see more of that would make you more likely to join? Uh, Skype, no, there's nothing in Skype here. Uh, we don't have any integration to search and report on them at this point in time. It's a machine today. Look at them go. Can you discovery break open distribution lists yet? Um, Kevin, are you speaking about like a, a general report where the general report will tell you who was in the deal at that time or something different? Okay, so if you need to know exactly who was in that distribution group at that point in time, you would still have to journal. Um, e discovery is an after the fact thing, so we would not know later on, unless you had, say, your message tracking logs available, if you stored those forever, 
Um, track DL changes. Um, I'd have to go back and take a look. You might be able to as a workaround. If you were to set up admin logging, perhaps with the set distribution group or update distribution group command list, you might be able to capture that, but I don't think that's something we do right now if you just want to get it into the admin logs themselves. Yeah, like Ethan said, if you check, check the message tracking logs, you might be able to get that information. Uh, Jeff, I'm not sure we'd go down to that level. You know, if somebody performs a search, and then what, what items do they open specifically? Comes down to trusting the trusting the trusters, right? We have to make sure that only the appropriate people have the permissions delegated. Oh, yeah, good idea. Mailbox audit logging. Yep, if you're using a e-discovery mailbox, we would get that. Good point. If you're doing, like, in-place hold where the items are just in the mailbox itself, I'm not sure if we're going to... We might get that. But you'd have to have a lot of on all those mailboxes. Okay, we have time for maybe just one more question, if we skip yours. And, again... Uh, if we don't get to your question, feel free to send me a message and um, we'll make sure we'll get it to the right, we'll get it to Brian. Uh, SkyDrive Pro, SkyDrive Pro is SharePoint in the background. So if you're searching a, what's your email? Uh, that's probably a better one handled on the forum, Todd. We don't have hooks into their discovery center with their index and all their stuff. Um, but, but before Josh cuts us off, thank you everybody for joining. It's been a pleasure. Good questions as always. Thanks to everybody that's, uh, got their comments here and thanks to all the other Microsoft folks that are helping out. Appreciate it. Yeah, great session. Thanks so much, Brian, and everyone for joining. And, uh, again, feel free to send any feedback or questions or any comments to me or Ryan right there. And uh, we'll see you next week at our next Ignite webcast.